so yeah uh, let without further any delay let's start the session everyone can hear me right yeah, panelist uh, yeah yeah we can hear you okay yeah so hi everyone i am divyansh and i will be the host for today's session few words about the organizers we are a bunch of people from us citizen of science astrowing that have been organizing various sessions on astronomy and astrophysics whether it's the technical side of story or just know how how to get into an astro programs in india and abroad links of these previous sessions as well as our telegram group would be provided in the chat so so um one major part of applying to foreign programs in astrophysics or in any astronomy program is writing sops that is a statement of purpose and making cvs today's session will focus on this issue and would be a discussion that would result in taking away major points regarding the sops and cvs while this discussion is related to astro programs only points discussed discussed today can be followed in general towards applying any other fields of interest so um let me just give you a quick overview of what we are going to do today so um yeah so we will be discussing questions that we have collected from a form that we have circulated uh, circulated around various groups and have selected questions uh, regarding the today's session and um, we those questions cover pretty much of every major doubt that we already had uh, in our mind as well as the other people but yeah don't worry for the plethora of doubts from you people we will be having a question and answer session uh, 30 minutes before the end of the session so yeah people the queries of the people will be answered so um so yeah meanwhile also uh, do not forget to uh, pin down your questions into the chat box anyways um for today's session we have invited four panelists that are pursuing ms or phd from different parts of world to discuss and shed some light on the abuse of doubts regarding the sops and cvs our first panelist is um akash gupta a first year master student at ludwig maximilian university munich his research interest and are uh, star formation and multivalent astronomy hi akash are you there yeah hi hi i am there hi hello okay. everyone so um our second panelist uh, is anshuman acharya he is a final year student at iscr mohali pursuing a bachelor's and masters in physics currently working on a masters thesis jointly at smithsonian astrophysical observatory at harvard and iscr mohali he is working in the field of stellar x-ray astronomy particularly looking into the magnetic star planet interactions in a specific planetary systems he has um, he has also applied for the phd programs in europe and us for the fall 2021 hi anshuman are you there yeah yeah okay our third panelist is nagula agrawal he is a first year master thesis student with a specialization in experimental particle physics at university of alberta canada he is working on the search for experimental signatures of quantum gravity and physics beyond standard model using ice cube observatory at geographic south pole hey nicole are you there hi everyone hi now our fourth and last or the final panelist is vabhav sharma a third year phd student at cornell university us his work is in theoretical physics studying ultra cold quantum matter so hi vabhav are you there hi hello everyone yeah so um so just me uh, let me remind that this will be a, this is going to be a general discussion so i would be throwing questions to you all to all the panelists and you can answer them in any order but yeah uh, because of uh, so we would like to form a simple structure of that i would uh, circle through the questions and any one of you panelists can join into or add into any question any answer any time sure that would be okay yeah sure. yeah okay yeah So yeah, so let's start the session. Uh, let me just look at the list of the questions. So, um, so let's start with the first question. Uh, I would be putting that to you, to Akash. Would that be okay, Akash? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, sure. I'm going to put forward the first question to you. Would that be okay? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, first question from the questionnaire, right? The previous. Yeah. 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 
Okay, so, in, uh, which shall I share it or I don't know? No, no, I would read out uh, if you want, you can share it, but I would read out the question. Ah, okay. okay, okay, so um, what is the basic or the general approach to make CV and SOP for internships uh, with people that are uh, freshers or just beginning into the field? Okay, so uh, for for internships, if you ask me like CV. Uh, so I think main takeaway should be something like uh, the programming part because I, I guess the, the professors look look for people uh, who who know programming very well uh, for internships and uh, this kind of things and so I, I don't know I don't think SOP matters that much in CV but uh, but yeah so you should have like something solid about your programming background and something like that. Okay. Any of the panelists would like to add into this? Yeah, and in terms of the general structure of the CV, uh, I guess the main point that they're trying to ask is that they don't have any past research experience mm -hmm. uh, as a fresher. So, but that is fine. Like, uh, uh, if there's anything, like, say, if you have even read something yourself, you can, uh, as a like a self-assigned reading project, you can mention that. And then, mm -hmm. if, even if there's nothing else, just mention whatever, say, your first year grades and whatever is there. Any other details that you feel are important and that's it like that it's not very important that you your first year cv should be very big and detailed or something like that just should show that yeah you are interested and uh, you're trying to find some opportunities and like obviously like if your programming skills that is uh, that is very good okay nakul babo would you like anything to add into this okay um just one thing for internships i think um, um as far as the page limit goes i think everybody prefers a one page cv um for research internships you might be able to go a little beyond but uh, in general for internships one page cv is preferred people do not like more than that okay so shall i move to the next uh, next question okay so um, another question, uh, it, it will be to you, Anshuman. Uh, how do you write yeah, SOP just, effectively? Just a second, Divyanshu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. So yeah. all the people, let me, sorry for the interrupting. Uh, 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 we have a Telegram group. The link was shared by uh, uh, Jaya shared. Uh, I want to share a few links, but, but the links I share in the chat here, they will be lost. So like if you could join the group, Telegram group from there, uh, I can share you the, because there's a specific blog post written about how to rate, uh, write mails and stuff. I can share you the links there so you could uh, find a, a record of them or all the links that uh, that will be shared in the meet. You can directly find them in the chat right there. Just for that. Yeah, please okay. continue, Divya. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Anshuman, uh, next question yeah. is to you. To you. Um, how do you write SOPs effectively so that all points are highlighted and what should be the length of SOP for both PhD and internships? Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, when it comes to internships, it's often like it, uh, the uh, not all programs want you to write a very detailed SOP. Some are okay mm. with a very short one. The uh, best example is that of the uh, Indian Academic, uh, Academy of Sciences. Their program requires a 200-word SOP. Yeah, so yeah. firstly, keep, uh, keep in mind the word limit. For PhDs, there is a very uh, common thing that it's either two pages or 1,000 words. Like at least that's what I encountered uh, in my process this year. Uh, so that is what you need to keep in mind in terms of the word limit uh, and mm -hmm. adjust accordingly. And uh, secondly, it is like uh, different universities uh, have uh, they frame the question about the SOP in a particular way. Like they tell you what points to include uh, very explicitly in a very detailed manner. Uh, and sometimes they'll also tell you that you can write an optional uh, personal history statement like if you have any, any special circumstances you can mention that in a separate essay so you don't need to include all that into the sop mm. uh, say any exceptional circumstances or or even like say uh, the, for the organizers in this uh, of this club like you do, you are doing some really cool stuff so you can mention that in that personal <laughs> history statement okay so uh, the, the coming to the sop itself it will be like uh, uh, the basic crux is like why ex like why exactly are you applying for a PhD there. Then you have to say, what background do you have? So it was like, if there's any coursework that was there, research internships are there, everything that mm -hmm. needs to build up. And in the end, 
you have to sh- uh, you have to basically show that okay because of these experiences i am interested to work on say xyz and uh, say galaxy evolution and uh, with professor x and uh, that's why that's why based on that i'm applying to this program you for american universities i see uh, like in some examples that i saw and like with some phd students that i talked to the it was like if you have something a bit extra that you can uh, uh, contribute to the community say like you you have engaged in science outreach then you can mention that and based on that uh, then uh, you can mention that in like say the last paragraph like mm-hmm. say some extra curricular or something like this some some science outreach uh, etc and then you basically end it with uh, like because of these things i feel, feel that it's a good fit so the what the, what this stru- basic structure helps you with is that your your research experiences and the end thing which is your extra curriculars and that you feel you are a good fit to this university are basically the same for across all sops that you will write for all universities what you need to change is what exactly you would be focusing upon like say if some department is uh, um, working uh, in some particular field then you can mention that and but if you are interested in another department as well in another university you can tailor your sop accordingly uh yeah, yeah. and uh, if if some sops do not have a word limit uh, still try to stick to two pages because just yes, because i don't say anything it should be wrong to go beyond uh, above and beyond that yeah, uh, yeah those are very good points i guess yeah 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 you you were adding something and um, i think i should should be fine but uh, others can add in like i might have missed something okay vaibhav nakul akash i mean uh, he pretty much covered everything almost everything so yeah okay okay so shall i move to the next question yeah yeah um just to add uh, i have that questionnaire um, i think it's around okay. 20 questions in sop like okay, you should okay, probably yeah. just uh, share whenever you uh, have time yeah yeah okay oh. so um, so i'm moving to the next question that i have uh, would that be okay nakul for right now yes 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 okay okay so uh, nakul how do you specifically mention financial struggle in the sop while applying for uh, phd programs um personally i wouldn't um do that um mm-hmm. it looks bad and okay. i have talked about this to my supervisor and he even suggested that if you are looking for financial uh, some sort of scholarship or funding uh, every university has a separate uh, wing which takes care of that where you have to apply uh, independently and um, also i believe if you have to write your financial struggle there's always a story to that so that will mm-hmm. cover approximately one paragraph in your sop that might be used uh, very well for other parts uh, of your statement um and in general i think i have read about this on the princeton's website and they have explicitly written as well that if you have if you need a uh, financial funding or so uh, there's a separate document uh, not I, that's not classified as an sop the, let's say there's a separate statement that you have to write as to why you need uh, this financial funding um i'm not sure whether some pension but somebody's uh, some university's website and that's generally the trend so that's my take um i do not think you should write financial struggle in the sop maybe one or two lines um when so uh, in the starting of the sop when you're trying to write about your background why you fell in love with physics somewhere there you can like s- switch in one or two lines but i don't know it it l- looks very bad that's what i think yeah. i i completely agree with that i mean uh this uh it, it should not be included in sop rather i mean there are some some options for scholarships after the admit and uh, stipendium or something like that so i think th- that's where you need to put your story rather than in sop sop uh, yeah, it looks bad i totally agree with that Have yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I guess one case where you can actually write about it and don't write about it too much, but is that, for example, if your financial struggle led to, for example, one semester where you sort of took a break or your grades suffered or something like that, mm-hmm. or there's some, or there's some reason that because of the financial struggle you were not able to do research for that 
one summer or one year. Those those hardships you can mention, but only if they're related to your academics. Um, and otherwise, I would say since everybody's funded the same, you get the same stipend once you come here. And so then it sort of doesn't matter because you'll be paid the same amount. And for the application fee, you can apply for a waiver that you can say that uh, yeah, you can apply yeah. for. So in that case, also the financial struggle sort of takes care of itself. So unless it's related to academics, Mention. Yeah, and uh, a lot of uh, universities, at least the US ones, have the uh, optional personal history statement, like I mentioned. So there, if you if there it it has played a big role in your life and it is it has affected you, like uh, uh, he mentions, where you can mention you can write it separately. But the SOP can be focused on what all you have done academically and how that that motivate your application right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's like uh, subtle hints to the uh, financial situation. Is it like that? Not directly implicating that we need financial assistance, but so subtle hints regarding that that uh, we joined a company or something um, before uh, admitting to the MS programs or PhD programs. So that yeah, uh, and like uh, that. mostly mostly PhD programs do provide financial assistance. So mm. that is usually not an issue. The mm. issue creeps up in MS programs where. It is uh, the funding is more competitive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, guess, yeah. just to add to that because we have raised a very good point. Um, this won't be a problem for when you are applying for PhD, but this will be a problem if you're applying for master's program mm -hmm. because not every like most master's students in US I know do not get funded. The TA the TA funding also comes very late. Uh, so, but most applications have a different statement and it's for example uh, because in the questions i can see there's only a mention of financial struggle but there are all a lot of other things like diversity uh, for yeah. example if you are from um, lgbtq plus community and stuff like that they have questions like that in the application uh, separately yeah. apart from sop so i don't think you should you need to worry about all your personal struggles that much because they definitely include that in other parts of your application Okay, so yeah, I guess that answers that question pretty much. I guess so. Can we move on to the another section? Another question? Yeah, I guess so. Um, Vabha, uh, if there are multiple purposes, how to align them to make an impressible, uh, impressible SOP? Um, there should be only one purpose, PhD. <laughs> um, but apart from, I guess, uh, if multiple purposes means that, like, I'm guessing it means that you have like different or two or three research interests or something like that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what it means? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would say. Uh, um, so I presume that in that case, you have, say, two or three research experiences in those two or three fields. Uh, and if that is the case, then sh you should definitely mention those research experiences in isolation where you say you did this research, you, you had, this was your contribution, and X was your results or something. And then there's two ways you can go about it. One, if you're applying to a university where there is a particular kind of research you want to do, then you highlight the one, the relevant research experience the most, and the other two are sort of then uh, their uh, level is decreased in some sense, and you only highlight the one which is important. That's one way to go about it. The other yeah. way to go about it is that if you really don't know which of the two fields or three fields you're sure about, three would mm. probably be too big a number, two is still fine. Then you just honestly actually mention it, that you say, I did research in both these things. I think I really enjoyed both of them. I, I gained a lot of important skills in both of them. And I'm open to exploring both these areas. And then you sort of mention that, OK, this X university that you're applying to, presumably, of course, should have good faculty or good research programs in both of those fields. So then you can say, I would be a great fit, and either of them I would explore and sort of, this would be a good university because of that, since it has both the fields. So I think that would be the way to go about it. Either be honest that I'm not sure, or focus on one. Yeah, yeah. that's good, I guess. Be upfront about it, and then make sure that professors do agree with that, that it's all right. Yeah, usually it's fine. I mean. The only problem would be that if you say I'm interested in two fields and then the target university only has like faculty or research work in one of them and not the other, then then that looks bad because that, that's not good research then. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. First, Nicole. 
Anshaman, would you like to add anything to this? Ah, uh, no, that pretty much covers it. Okay. Okay, so shall I move to the next next question? Yeah. Yeah. So Akash, how yeah. shall I approach a PhD supervisor? Shall I send him a CV SOP cover letter in the first mail itself? Ah, uh, honestly, I have not emailed any uh, PhD, uh, like any profs for PhD. Okay. But but I think uh, once I did did in US, I think. So I, I mailed the professor with my uh, research interest and everything, and he said to apply via the UST portal. Just he just replied that, and uh, yeah, that's it. So I I think uh, better Webho or uh, Webho Hotel because he's in PSC right now. Okay, Webho. Um. Uh, so if you are, uh, I guess the question means that this is before you apply to the university, right? You're sort of maybe sitting in India and then you want to approach somebody for a PhD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I've heard, so <laughs> one thing I've learned here is that professors get a lot of email, like when you come here, then you realize that professors get so many emails that you, you realize that if your emails are ignored, that it's probably okay. Like my emails were ignored. Everyone's emails get ignored. E even right now, they sometimes get ignored because they get a lot of emails. So I would say, uh, if you're emailing, um, there's a good chance that you won't get a reply, which is fine. Always be okay. mindful of that. Um, but I would say the best way to get a reply is keep your emails short. They shouldn't be too long. Um, and I, I would say that don't dump them with all your CV and SOP and everything. They don't have time to read all of it. Yeah, don't send uh, everything at once. <laughs> yeah, so just, just try to start like a conversation probably that, and there should be a good reason why you're contacting them. Say their website is outdated and you don't know if they're taking students or not, or like you want to know more about the research or one of the recent papers or something like that. Uh, so yeah, just try to start a conversation that you know you are interested in the field, and you saw this this project that they are doing. Are they still taking students, and how would they still be taking students to work on those projects? And then if the professor really wants a conversation, they would probably reply with something, and there's a good chance they won't. So yeah, then you just have to live with it. Okay, Nakul, Anshuma. Yeah, I'd, like I had recently done gone through this process, like uh, because I'm still awaiting results right now for. The US yeah. universities, especially. So uh, the thing is that uh, obviously don't dump all things together. You can maybe write a short email saying that you are interested uh, because of say some recent work they have done or uh, something that uh, say some they have mentioned explicitly that there's some project opening. And uh, based on the, that, you can also mention that okay, uh, for the, I'm interested in this and my relevant experiences. You can mention like two three lines about uh, the different research experiences you have. And then just mention that you'll be happy to talk with them about like if they are willing to take students in the uh, near future or, and something. And uh, of course, mention that, OK, for more details, I've attached my CV. Uh, like they, say, they said that it's uh, majority of emails get don't get replies. That is still true here in this case. Uh, like It's always true. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, And some people will just reply that, OK, you uh, uh, apply to our program, we'll see. But there are some professors who will be interested. Like uh, they end up like they'll be like, okay, let's talk on Zoom or something. And yeah. so that can lead to that. That all like even if you don't end up working with them, you at least get an idea about like uh, what kind of projects are being done out there right now. So you can basically network with within the community. Like if if you got to know that okay, this project is something that's being done by a lot of people. Then you can reach out to other people in that. Like even if that professor is not going to uh, is not going to take you, then you can approach others who are working on that project and uh, f find another opportunity that way. Yeah, Nakul, would you like to say something? Um, in US, the selection procedure is very different as compared to Canada and Europe because in most US universities, you are not uh, like directly given a supervisor uh, when you are selected. That is not the case with Canada and Europe. You have to, like for most universities in Canada and Europe, you have to first approach somebody and then you send your application. They recommend it. Uh, with me in my master's program, I had to first uh, find a supervisor to get selected in the university. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I definitely first uh, went to his website. Um, he was looking for students. 
and I hit him up. I just uh, replied to him that um, a very short as to uh, my background and what I've done so far. I will I'll sing five or six lines, and I'm interested um, in the work that you are doing. And then he replied me, if you can send me your CV and uh, a brief statement. And that is how I think it should be, rather than sending your CV SOP directly in the first email. I'll tell you one a particular trouble with that. When you do that, what happens is um, some of the people have this in their uh, Gmail accounts that it uh, directly goes to uh, uh, trash or spam. Mm -hmm. So do not include CV SOP unless, like, uh, unless until they have written it in their website that contact us by sending a CV. Just I think uh, write an email that will be better, and do not send any links in your. Uh, um, email because that also sometimes goes directly to spam. So make sure of that. I like uh, uh, my friend in US told me that that is uh, that um, many professors there have this inbuilt. So uh, just um, make sure of that. Yeah, so, I mean in general, um, sending emails directly would be a luck based game like that. Uh, so it would totally depend upon the kind of professor he is and whether he checks the emails or not or whether his spam filter is working or not and do not never ever yeah. do not directly send all those details in the first go uh, maintain a conversation first start a conversation and then uh, if that continues then send him over for send him the cv and the sop thing for the next mail or the another another things yeah, just to add to that because the links i was mentioning are tracking links do not send that. Okay. Nobody likes it. Okay. Okay. So I guess, yeah, let's move on to the next question. Hmm. Anshuman, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm just answering. Someone has asked something on the chat. So. Okay, okay. So can yeah. I ask you the next question or should yeah, I? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay. So the question is about uh, basic info about the transcripts and the cover letters. I mean, why are transcripts necessary or uh, how to get them out? And cover letters, how to write the cover letters in precise? OK, yeah, the cover letter usually, like uh, I had two, three places which asked for the cover letter. They uh, often tell you what exactly has to be there. Uh, okay. uh, or uh, uh, like in my experience, it is like basically you just say that uh, in very briefly you mention your interests and then uh, that should be like one or two lines and then uh, that you're applying to their program and you have attached the following documents and you list out all your documents including uh, every single thing that you have attached uh, even if it's not attached with the cover letter itself you have uh, added as a pdf on their application form you still mention all of that and then uh, you can also mention that you're uh, you have three recommenders who are going to send letters which will be uh, and then mention their names as well, so that just in case to keep everything on track. Uh, mm, yeah. And that's about it. Like you, it's usually pretty short. Cover letter does not need that much effort or anything. As for transcripts, uh, they just want to see that you you have been doing some something at least, and it should be fine. Uh, but if you have anything like very any grades which are very bad or something, and if you can get so one of your recommenders to explain about that, then like say you were you had some issue or anything then that's fine otherwise I'd let, just let it be just let your entire application talk for you okay um, do they check transcripts for the i mean eligibility criteria too like 3.5 gpa and everything uh, for international students they have their own separate criteria but uh, uh, usually the uh, like in uh, i think so for europe they have specific criteria which is usually not that strict uh, for US also, they have uh, they often have uh, these uh, eligibility criteria, but uh, there have been cases where like if you have good research experience, then they will be willing to relax it. So they just take a look. They won't directly convert your CGPA to out of four. They'll understand uh, that there are certain differences, but they will uh, expect say like if it is out of ten, then there it should be at least seven plus or sorts. That's like the very b bare minimum. Yeah. OK, I want to add uh, on this CGP criteria yeah, yeah. here. So uh, here, I mean, they're kind of a little bit, I think, strict about CGPA, something like, uh, like there's no bar. But 
in some courses they are like pretty high bars like 90 gpa and something like that but but i think uh, for a for a place in like english taught programs here in germany you need a decent gpa like something like above 7.5 or something something like that and uh, there's also something called uni assist through which many universities uh, ask for their application so if you have like a cgpa less than the required cgpa of a university you are like automatically rejected uh, they, they don't see anything else then so there are some cases where they are straight but not every university yeah i mean just i think in the us the cgpa it's not the overall number that matters most mostly it's that uh, they would look for the core subjects so like your grade in quantum mechanics dnm stat me classical mechanics those are the important things i think yeah nagul are you there yeah um i i agree with akash because um cgpa definitely matters a lot in europe um like sometimes even more than your research so i know a friend who got rejected directly from where akash is studying so the maximilian because his cgpa was less um, i don't know what's the prescribed cgpa there but it was less than that so um in europe i think uh, cgpa is important not uh, not in canada and us and uh, what know. was your original question devanshu i do not uh. um, Okay, Something so I related to uh, cover letters and transcripts. Diversity in transcripts? Uh, no, yeah, I mean, uh, are they checking the transcripts for the CGPA criteria and things? Okay, okay, no problem. I heard, I, I heard something else. No problem. Okay, okay. So, uh, next question would be to you, Nicole. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, is there a uh, is there a country based format for CV and SOPs? like uh, applying to Euro european or american universities i think um the distinction is not uh, primarily focused on nationality but i think the distance is this the distinction is more on the program you are applying to for example um for most european universities professors they release this um, phd positions on their portals or even on the uh, department of physics portal and um, they sometimes want you to uh, write an sop explicitly based on the kind of work that you want to do with the professor so uh, in that i think that that is the only distinction that is usually the case um, when it comes to writing an sop otherwise when you are sending your application where it will be judged by the entire application committee there you do not write that specifically uh, in your sop that this is like not the end one page not one page is dedicated as to what kind of research you will do with the professor there for example i believe somebody was um, messaging me and um, he was applying to uh, ligo based work um, numerical general relativity and there explicitly on the application it was written what kind of only state in your sop what kind of work you want to do with us so when you have to explain that when you have to write that stop that sort of statement of purpose there i believe um, um you have to go very specific otherwise it's general um i do not think that is there's any distinction between at least for canada and europe um web of can probably shed more light when it comes to american universities Um sorry what was the question i think i was looking in the chat didn't realize so it was related to the particular formats regarding the european or the canadian um uh, european or the us universities regarding sops mm -hmm. or cvs um i mostly apply to us and like in the us it's this the sop is just uh, they pretty much tell you the prompt that what they require and it's usually two pages of you know you can be as creative as you want and i think the cv nothing is usually mentioned but i guess just follow the uh, tips for an academic cv so it should be an academic cv for a phd application 
And I remember applying to one European university, and I think my application was pretty much the same. Like the SOP was kind of similar and the CV as well. So there was, but that was just one European university, but it wasn't much of a difference in my opinion. Okay. Akash? Yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes uh, some European universities like uh, want Europass CV, something called Europass CV. I mean, I did not provide them. I just uh, sent the normal CV, but that's no problem. I mean, you can just send the normal academic CV and it works. There's no need for special CV. But yeah, if you have time, you can make a Europass CV. Uh, I mean, it's a website, Europass something. You can easily make it there. Okay, so what's different about it? I don't know. I did not make it. I tried, but uh, okay. some, some standard European format. I mean. OK. Anshuman? Yeah, like that. I've heard about the Europe Pass, but like uh, it's only asked by some particular universities. Like with yeah. the, the places I applied to, I've I applied to three places in, in Europe right now, or four places, and uh, none of them asked. Like they were fine with uh, the yeah. usual academy. Yeah, both places, both places are fine. I mean, if only I mean, some. Yeah, sorry. Hi. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, thought, I thought we lost you. Okay. No, no. Am I am I audible right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, continue. yeah, I'm extremely sorry. So, uh, next question is to you, Weber. Mm -hmm. um, how to make SOP more personalized and evade the general generic methodology of SOP writing? Um, <laughs> I think in general, a lot of SOPs would definitely sound the same, um, and that's because they kind of are the same. Like <clears throat> everybody is required to just mention the research experience and why you want to join a particular university and yeah they would at some level too would sound the same i guess the personalized bit is that your research is unique so make sure you sort of describe it honestly and i, I wouldn't pay much attention to sort of uh, you know it doesn't matter the sort of the writing style or something that that's probably not a thing to worry about it's more just describing a research experience and having a compelling reason why you're applying to a particular university and the other things like you know you don't need special words or for way of sentences it's it should be just clear concise and honest i think basically that would speak for itself okay anshuman nakul agash would like to shed some light on this no i think they, like this this could i mean he said I think. yeah yeah nakul um one a key mistake I think that most people do is just uh, copy paste the CV in the SOP, like just writing like whatever projects that you have written there, and then you are describing them in detail here. I think it uh, affects your application very badly. Um, I'll do like do not scrub in all the information that you did in the project in your SOP. Rather, three to four lines about the project or your research paper will be good. Mm -hmm. And I will, um, as a point, how to make it more personalized, what I have done so far is that my final two paragraphs are dedicated as to what kind of research I will do and um, which professors entice me, which research group uh, resonates with my aspirations and stuff. So that is where um, I make it very personalized. And that also has that also changes with university to university. and. Somebody suggested me, um, I can think um, one, I don't know how much this is relevant, um, but she writes um, SOPs a lot and she suggested me this. I was talking to her and she told me that um, sometimes they like if you write um, the vision of the university in the final two paragraphs. Like for example, let's say you're applying to some X university, they have the vision on their website and you kind of tells how their vision, just one, in one or two lines, how their vision resonates with your aspirations. That kind of also uh, builds a rapport with the university. Then you say a similar line with the Department of Physics, and then you go ahead and um, 
you mentioned that this research group uh, is very interesting. Then you tell these are the professors with whom I'm interested to work. And finally, a goodbye statement like that. So this is how uh, the final two paragraphs or even final three paragraphs can become very personalized. But make sure that these are there in the SOP because just writing uh, a detailed explanation of CV and SOP will not work. Okay. Okay, so uh, Vabha, we had some points regarding the professor's perspective on this CVs and uh, SOPs. Uh, yeah, yeah. I actually wrote them down. Maybe I can just share my screen. Yeah, 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 sure, definitely. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Can everyone see it? Yep, oh, we can. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so very bare bones, nothing too much. But this is sort of a summary of this is sort of information from our professors. Uh, there was a workshop at Cornell some time back uh, for applicants of about how to write the SOP. And this is just a very short summary of what the professors think what there should or shouldn't be in an SOP. So first slide is what not to say in the SOP. Um, first point is that they don't want to hear about your childhood fascination with science and physics. Yeah, don't mention that. That's five years old. I saw a magnet or whatever. You know, things like that don't matter. Clearly, you're fascinated with physics, and that's why you're applying to a PhD program. So that's sort of all, already apparent and redundant. The second thing they don't like is if being too technical in describing your research experience. So like, I mean, you should be technical, but not too technical, right? So don't just throw jargon at them because Remember that your research experience will probably in one field, but the application committee is made of professors of different fields. So if you're too technical, then sort of the other people won't be able to parse it, and then it won't be helpful. So don't be too technical. Uh, not sounding serious or professional, you don't need, uh, you know, you don't need to, you don't need to sound like funny or you don't need to be poetic or anything. Just be honest and serious and professional. Like, yeah, shouldn't sound insincere, basically. Uh, yeah. And too many fancy words just for the sake of them. Yeah, don't just open a thesaurus online and just <laughs> substitute like um, complicated synonyms for simple words. That that all always sounds fake and like it would be it would it would show in the SOP. So yeah, again, just be uh, very normal words and just very honest. That was it. Mm. And then what they're looking for, um, what they're looking for is one primarily your research experience. And within that, what they want is you should have uh, what was the big picture goal of the research you did, uh, your specific contribution, where what, which is what you did, and sort of end with what you liked or learned. That's one thing they're definitely looking at. The other th important thing is why you're applying to the respective university. And you should talk about specific faculty or groups that you're interested in working with. That's definitely something they're looking for. The the other things sort of related is that why you can be a good fit to the field you're applying to. That that's also they're looking for. So some compelling reason that oh I want to do particle physics. Why do you think you can do particle physics? Right? You should have a compelling reason. Something like that. Uh, any anomaly in academic grades? There was one semester you got really bad grades, or you know somebody mentioned I think they got in an accident or something. So yeah, definitely mention those anomalies because they won't know where they came from. Um, and if you have uh, any teaching or mentoring experience, that's a plus, and that would also be good. Uh, and you can sort of, yeah, teaching experience is generally taken in good regards. So you can mention that you have some teaching experience and everything, and that you intend to follow that in grad school and your career beyond that. So that would be a good thing to mention. So these are probably yeah. the things to mention and take the SOP. I guess one thing I just wanted to share um, is this snippet of describing the research experience. I think that's sort of um includes the points i made yeah i don't know if i should read it out <laughs> but it just starts with um what i basically okay i did this summer research work at university of bristol in 2017 i just mentioned the big picture goal that the professor he searches for physics beyond the standard model by analyzing their dk's from the lhc data that's sort of the big picture goal and then i mentioned what i did i developed the machine learning code in python to separate background from signal basically and then at the end, I mentioned that I was able to develop a code that at least did it from a simulated data set. It was a two month internship. I couldn't really get to the real data set. So I just mentioned that, you know, all I did is that I showed that the code performed on a simulated data set. 
I mentioned that I like learned machine learning to handle large data set and enjoy implied principles of particle physics. And then at the end, I also gave a talk, just mentioned that. And yeah, that's probably it. even this can be shortened, but that's sort of one example of just not being too technical and mentioning what is uh, in your research. Yeah. This was great and very helpful, I guess. Mm. Thanks, Abu, for sharing the screen and showing us these points. Uh, hi, Nakul. Yeah, just to add to that, so I have this uh, pattern yeah. for everything. So for a project like Weber, Weber is written very uh, properly. You start mm. where you did your project, what you did, what were the technical challenges that you faced, and how you overcame them, and what were your final effective contributions to the project. Like this is the um, kind of format that I have followed for ev like for every project that you that you want to write. Now for defending every research paper, you start with uh, like this is only my opinion. Um, so you start yeah. with what kind of uh, like how you got into the research uh, idea first. That can be you contacted some professor, he pitched you some idea, or it was your own idea. Then how you developed. Uh, your interest in how you uh, worked persistently in that effort and then the final output was the paper even though let's say it's not published in a journal then you can also always say even it's on archive or uh, if you have sent it to some journal of uh, good repute so that is how i think research papers go uh, that is more so uh, regarding the internships so um, for internships, like Weber was written is more or less equivalent to a project. So I think that covers project, internships, research paper, yes, so more or less everything. Yeah. So you had a question here, right? Uh, would you like to share that? Nicole? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just share that. Um, also, before, uh, before we dive into that, um, yeah, yeah. There is this excellent forum that helped me a lot. It's physicsgre.com. Um, okay. So uh, for every year, they have this uh, specific detailed uh, article. Like for example, I've just I'm just opened 2019 applicant applicant profiles and uh, applicant profiles and admission results. I'll just share the link. Um, so for every year. They have these big detailed articles where people from all over the world have written everything, their CGPA, uh, their research experience, LORs and everything, and where did they apply, whether they got selected, waitlisted, rejected, what are their takes. You will get a lot of information uh, from this forum. And I believe it goes back to 2016. So that means we have five years of data uh, from this. And you will get every information, their GRE physics scores, so you kind of uh, have a good. Uh, uh, you can make you can go through everything and make your own statistical data and analyze it, and that kind of helped me as to where I should apply based on the kind of work that I have done. Al always make sure that um, you have limits, like in terms that, for example, I believe many of the people here they are probably going for a, a domain switch from engineering in bachelor's to physics in um, master's. And that is in itself is a very, very complicated thing because most universities, first of all, do not allow you. Like I know this for many European universities. I sent my application to Ludwig Maximilian. They, they rejected me the next day saying, you do not have a degree, bachelor's degree in physics. And at that time, they had not written it explicitly on their website that this was, the, this was their requirement. So, uh, this is a big problem for everyone who is going for this uh, uh, background switch. So um, there, uh, from this forum, you can definitely get an idea as to where you should potentially apply. Do not go for these far reach schools. Like even I saw um, Anshuman has mentioned in the chat, like MIT, Harvard, their selection procedure is very random and very, very different. I don't know how they select, but it's very, very random. So this forum will like bring you down, not saying uh, like demotivate you, but at least help you as to what kind of safe schools based on your profile you should apply to and not and be realistic and not be like 
uh, go beyond what you have because understand because we all know that the applications are very expensive a so you do not want to make the mistake where you're applying to top schools um you might be lucky i'm not saying do not apply to top schools you you, you can apply to one or two top schools but make sure that you apply to safe schools and that is why this forum is very good because they have this distinction as top schools safe schools uh, in my reach schools so um, i will definitely suggest to go through this website and regarding the questionnaire um, so um, i'll just share this thing because many people in india in general um, write uh, get their sops written from professionals and what happens is these professionals uh write very uh, like they include very bombastic words in your sop and when they look at your gre writing score if it's 3 out of 6 and you, you are writing a very fancy sop they know that what you have done is essentially like uh, um, somebody else has written it for you now this not just goes for sop i'll also say that for lors now most indian professors they are very lazy they do not want to write lors i am not sure if you have experienced this uh, so they ask you to uh, give 10 to 11 proper lines and they just add some feeder lines in that so if you are kind of doing that you want to make sure that it's not written uh, from some professional uh, just and when whenever the professor ask you to write the SO, uh, lor on their behalf do not ever do that that is that is very very wrong just write Uh, 10 pointers do not give full sentences let them write on their own because what happens is um, when you are writing believe that uh, realize that you also have a fixed vocabulary so that kind of vocabulary is common in your sop in your cv and then you are also mentioning that in your lor so they figure it out very easily that all of this is all of this is connected and you have probably written everything on your own and just then just sent it to the professor and he has uploaded it he or she has uploaded it so please make sure of all these tactics also make sure that um sometimes i have seen and and my professor also uh, told me that please send this lor on my behalf i am not able to do it do not do that because once that lor link is sent to you they have this system where they immediately know that the email has been forwarded to someone that they do not know to whom it has been forwarded but they know that it has been forwarded and straight away the uh, the grad coordinator rejects your application so it is very important that your lor link is not forwarded to anyone so if your uh, supervisor or if your uh, recommender is very old he is not able to you know uh figure out as to how to send it sit with him or her like help him or her to like so this is my uh, like this is your lor please uh, send it on your own so these are the mistakes that you need to make sure also one other key aspect your lors the ip link to which the lors are being sent as well as your application is being sent it needs to be different they also track uh, as to where your uh, lors and application are coming from so make sure they are not from the same ip link that will look your application is straight away rejected um so all these are key points so i um, i i have a friend uh, of mine who got his sop and everything written from somebody in jamburi whose questionnaire i'm going to share right now uh, she sent me that but uh, her application was rejected because everything was sent within a day and they knew that something is fishy so please make sure of all these uh, key points as well and i'll just yeah. um, sorry go ahead yeah, yeah, sure. no no sure sure ah. just a second like, yeah i would like to say that yeah nakul mentioned very very set of particular points that people do not pay attention or there to but yeah that can lead to the whole i mean rejection of the application process as well Thanks, Nagul. Um, sorry, I do not work with Google Meets that much, <laughs> so I'm right. still right. figuring out. Um, okay, uh, can you see my screen? 
Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Now yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, this is the SOP questionnaire um, that my friend sent, and uh, you can probably. So this is how I also went ahead while writing my SOP. So these are there are these couple of questions that you can first answer uh, by yourself. For example, I'm not saying that you have to write all these points. but this helps you to write a coherent story uh, i don't think we talked about this very much when you are switching from one paragraph to another in your sop make sure that it is not an abrupt jump it should be connected uh, in some way so this is the biggest problem i think that happens is when you are writing your sop directly on a document without having a plan in mind you are not able to write a very convincing coherent story So I think this is where this questionnaire might be able to help you because it gives you some background and a, a clear picture as to what you are, what you should write. So first question, I don't know, maybe it's not very important, but um, it's it's okay to write. I, it's okay to answer this question regarding your school details. Another question on your school details and how you developed interest in the field, um, stuff like that. Third question is like. Um, um what made you decide to study the subject of your undergraduate course or first three to four questions are not very very important um but um question number 5 for example what electives did you take in your undergraduate program this uh sometimes become very important for example uh you want you want to do your phd in general relativity and general relativity was not a direct course in your undergraduate program but was offered as an elective so this is where in one or two lines you can write uh, that this elective helped me a lot for example this is how i do it um, so i you have a research paper now you write that like when i was saying what 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 was motivation of how how did you first enter into that field so you can also write that uh, after i took this elective on general relativity i uh, uh, i found this particular idea let's say for example black hole shadows and um this is how i got interest in that i did this 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 work and this is my final output as a research paper so things like these also uh, first of all you are certainly telling them that you have done some advanced courses and how those advanced courses led you to do research so i think fifth question is helpful in that way when you are writing your sop um sixth question i think anshuman mentioned regarding extra curricular um it helps a lot i will just uh bind this to what uh webber said he uh, ali was sharing his slides there was a mention of mentoring and ta or uh, teaching experience so realistically in india you do not have uh, most uh, universities do not offer teaching assistantship roles so normally you do not have ta roles however uh, this is where the students in other universities have an edge over us because they have ta roles so for example uh, to counter that part if you have not done any ta work i did not do any formal ta work in my bachelors so to counter that i was associated with an astrophysics society i gave a lot of um, I, i had a lot of teaching sessions gave some lectures and so there you can probably connect your teaching and mentoring experience if you do not have a formal role um when it comes to point 6 and even if this helps a lot um i know that mit um uh, especially mit and harvard they look a lot for extra curricular activities so if you are part of some physics society or uh, you were uh, working in observational astronomy on telescopes you can write a uh, few lines uh, when it comes to point 6 Oh, seventh question is also more or less the same. Um, were you a member, leader of any club or society in college? Uh, eighth question has been covered. What projects did you take? And um, we have also seen as to how you should uh, write your detailed project. Ninth, uh, all presentations, training, seminars. We've also covered um, this point. So when you are trying to answer this question by yourself. this is where i will say write as much technical as you can because this will help you to filter out lines when you are writing it in sop so when you are answering question 9 give all details uh, like i said uh, when you are talking about a project write the project 
what was it about what were the technical challenges what did you do and what were the final contributions write as much detail but then cut short some lines when you are finally writing it in so um and where did your where did you do your summer internship industrial training web has already shared a snippet on this um 11th did you work after your undergraduate course uh, okay uh, so this is very relevant because uh, i took a year gap after my bachelor's and um, i did some these i did research in quantum computing so uh, like weber said uh, for example if there is there are any reasons as to your grades fell or you couldn't do research or why you took a year gap you somehow need to explain that in sop so if you have a year gap uh for example if you did some research do mention it it helps a lot um point 12 for which course and degree you are applying um what are your academic and career goals babu has already covered this point mention the particular areas of your interest in the masters or phd degree for which you are applying uh, basically the last two paragraphs of your sop also mention the subjects which you would like to study um, more or less the same uh so about this point also mention the subjects which you would like to study is very important when you are applying to a course based masters program you do not have to do research in that situation in the final two paragraphs you should mention as to what kind of subjects you want to study in your masters program otherwise this is not very relevant uh 14th uh yeah weber was uh, weber raised a very good point as to what particular strengths do you have in the subjects you want to study like what makes you a potential candidate uh, so that they should select you so um basically um they are looking i think i believe they are looking as to how you are going to outshine others um in this way so when you are writing about your strengths in the subjects uh, that helps a lot uh, research paper is done 16th is not very relevant what are your reasons for applying to this particular university again the last two paragraphs um i always uh, have written two to three professors in my last paragraph uh, with whom i am interested to work with and uh, but, but if you do not have a clear picture as to what kind of research you want to do in your phd then do not write this line like do not mention your specific interest um um like you can mention as to what kind of uh, subjects entice you but do not go that much into detail because if they because some universities have this program that they give you supervisor in the first year and if you kind of stuck in that program then you won't be able to do anything for example uh, i want to do theoretical physics even though my master is in experimental particle physics now i cannot switch now it won't be possible because i made a decision to work with this professor so you have to be sure uh, as uh, if you want to do if you want to go very specifically then you have to be sure in your mindset that this is what you want to do um if you are applying for masters you can probably write you can you want to uh, work in phd or you want to go ahead with your phd or you want to work in some research industry in physics so point 18th point 19th is more or less the same um social work or social service also helps a lot for example um uh, if you were teaching um so in my university there was uh, a club for underprivileged children where they were taught um uh, science related subjects so you can mention one or two lines as well um as to covering your teaching and mentoring experience and 21 is again what paper was already covered so this can be a very good uh, questionnaire when you write so usually this extends to 4 to 5 pages when you're writing on your own and then when you pick lines from this and write it in your sop that has to be converted to uh, less or equal to 2 pages yeah so this is what i have um i think this will be shared with you um in telegram or somewhere i think yeah it will be shared in the telegram group uh, as well as uh, we'll share it through a uh, google drive link as well very good speech mr nakul agrawal hi tushar hi hi so uh, nakul thanks uh, 
that was very informative and the questionnaire was on spot i guess it would surely help us and all the attendees who are trying to get into the phd programs all over the world um so i guess um, i have ended the questions that i have uh, collected uh, from the forms so let's move on to the question answer session and so there were a lot of questions and i can see that uh, panelists have been busy uh, answering them so thank you very much akash vaibhav nakul and anshuman yeah so you definitely uh, made my job very easier but uh, so uh, what can i do is that uh, i would be asking few of those questions and if they are already answered you can add to them or any other perspectives or something like that so sure. would that be okay we have our class okay <clears throat> so um akash yeah yeah so um there was someone who asked that um uh, their research interests are similar to yours so how to proceed i guess that was that yeah i think i think i replied to that but yeah i i'll just say i mean uh, so so in my uh, like star formation so mostly i did was like data reduction stuff and analyzing stuff so i mean mostly use astropy and python and my professor actually suggested me to use uh, something called casa common astronomical software applications and class but the thing is what i mean is python covers everything now so i i think you should actually enhance your python skills and uh, and yeah i mean we read some papers and uh, there are data, data sets available online like gaia direct uh, data releases available online and uh, some other data releases are available online you just play with the data and uh, read papers i think that would be best there are some books like uh, which you can start reading okay so um there was this question i am pursuing msc uh, second year program in physics currently my second sem is going on what is the optimum time to get started with overall process for applying abroad or so uh, for phd yeah for phd yeah i think uh, that that web web of it answer better the was i mean i did not apply for phd honestly so oh, sure you uh, will learn from here web um yeah i mean in general the earlier you start the better right it's always good to start early in a race but um i would say like in masters at least after the second semester in india usually have a summer break and i think that's a great time to start sort of planning what you want to do and at least shortlisting the universities and things like that so yeah, break after the second sem okay so how significant is a paper getting published in answers the chances for applying for phd positions abroad i'm currently enrolled in a masters program in astronomy here here at india i mean a paper Anyone is great <laughs> um yeah but i think uh, yeah and especially i i think i've mentioned it multiple times in the chat that if it's with one of your letter writers usually then it's just awesome right that you did a you wrote a paper with one professor and that professor writes a great letter then it sort of makes everything coherent and nice okay anshuman uh yeah um, so a paper is always helpful uh, of course nothing is a guarantee especially in the most competitive universities but uh, uh, like we have mentioned it, it definitely act uh, is very strong even if like say at the time of application you say that you have submitted and it's like not yet published that is also pretty like good enough you can just send like like if you especially have the archive link for it then just mention that somewhere in the application and that's good enough okay so um someone is asking that if i have a good experience like working in the clean space sector closely with isro and nasa uh, but have a very low cgpa would that affect my application any one of you can answer that or present some views on that uh, actually that depends on university right i mean yeah. cannot say like one common thing for every university so Many university will ask, I will consider. Many won't directly. I mean, if they have strict CGP criteria, they won't consider. I mean, so it's an university. 
yeah just to but just yeah you should apply I mean. yeah just to give a perspective on numbers um every year we are there's a presentation here that tell you about the admission stuff to us and at least at cornell uh they mentioned they get around like 650 700 applications which is a big number and then you can think about there there might be some people who have great research experience but not so good grades on the other hand there are some people with great research experience and also great grades and in a competition where you have 25 spaces out of 600 sometimes yeah the choice would go with one who has both good grades and good research experience so yeah just there, there is always competition so yeah who no one can say um so someone is asking that um what's the required number of lors stuff care to shed some light on it I think three is the three, yeah, three is max. number. I mean, yeah, they would always mention like, yeah, not three or like instead of three, it's two or something like that. Three. I mean, most common is two, I guess, but I can for safety this PhD three. programs are three. Yeah, PhD. Okay, yeah, sorry. I think it in masters it's sorry. Yeah, 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 true. For PhD it could be three. Sorry. So, uh, someone uh, asked the question that. Uh, I just saw a video on YouTube that is it, it is it not recommended to do a PhD at USA as it is compulsory to have five years of it until postdoc you reach your middle ages being jobless. They say it is recommended to have extracurricular activities if we change our mind and that this option is not available at US universities as they are very studious. So is this true? That was probably a prank video like given the <laughs> content that I can <laughs> Uh, moderator sent sent me the question, so I'm just saying that. Um, anyways, uh, someone asked that. Um, do they check your social media or something? No, I don't. No. Yes, maybe uh, LinkedIn. Maybe LinkedIn, because yeah, some LinkedIn. places ask like you can mention your LinkedIn or maybe you can mention your, if you have a website of of sorts. But that's so, usually, yeah. usually professors like they're so busy yeah, they only read their application. I don't think so. Yeah, no one has time. The only people who will like look at your social media are the US visa counselors like when you sit yeah. for the interview because now they have uh, applied this rule that you have to provide a social media links as well. So if you have oh, yeah, anything against US media. then make sure then you are definitely getting rejected at the interview. So do not post anything against US if you are planning to apply to US. Do not post anything in favor against Trump or whatever. Because okay. they are track, they will be tracking your social media accounts when you apply for the interview. I think against Trump will be fine now. <laughs> okay. But you never know whether the counselor who is sitting there is a Trump supporter or ah, not. Yes. <laughs> Interviews oh, are very stressful. <laughs> so okay, I I can also tell you like uh, do not write anything like for Hitler if you are coming to Germany or say anything. <laughs> like okay uh, people would make faces and might kick you okay so some answer unsaid rules i guess <laughs> yeah. so um while writing an sop in it, it it's someone tendency i mean it's normal it's tendency to explain one's interest in subject it you usually gets very poetic so one should always doubt that is it really good or not. It happens with the flow, I guess, with the writing. When we are writing about something that we have very much interest, it usually gets poetic. So is it good? Anyone? Ajwan, Nakul, Baba? Sorry, what was the question again? Yeah, can you repeat? I mean, I could not get it. OK, so I guess uh, from what I understand, uh, the person is asking that uh, when we are trying when when we are trying to write an SOP, uh, um, we are on explaining the subject that we have interest in, so it gets a little poetic. So we don't have any idea whether it's really good or whether we are saying it is a, like it's own, it's the perfect thing. Um, I think, like I mentioned, that just be yeah, just talk as if you are talking to another physicist. Like, just be professional and sort of mature in your. Um, words i would say you don't need to be fancy you don't need to be poetic or you don't need to be a writer just be honest and sincere and serious okay 
okay so there was another question what uh, precisely in programming would be uh, would be expected modeling data analysis uh, specifically specifically for an application for a phd program any one of you can answer um i mean in general that's just my general view about programming that any programming that you do once you learn how to program i think you can then sort of program anything like it doesn't really matter right once you know the fundamentals of programming and you have command over say one language i think then you are you can probably program any project given enough background and enough background knowledge so i think it won't matter that much i would say Ashwan, you were... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it really depends on uh, because you do not know what exactly you would be doing in the PhD thesis project, uh, right? So, if, but you can obviously like if you know what the basic language requires and you you have a grasp of what computer logic flow is, like how do you design algorithms? That's good enough. So you you can translate skills. It's just a matter of syntax uh, in the end. So if uh, as long if you have any programming experience, mention it. and if uh, like anything you explore just yeah keep that on uh, mention it somewhere yeah nakul you were trying to say something um it depends a lot on where you are applying for example uh, my work is in computational physics and i had like written in detail about the kind of computational uh, projects that i have done and in my in when the admission committee took my interview they specifically asked as to what kind of not what kind of programming experience that you have but they went rather a step ahead and they asked what kind of familiar with parallel programming and stuff like that how um, how many lines of code you have written and stuff so it depends on the program a lot because my program requirements were in experimental and computational physics so yeah but uh, <clears throat> like chinmay said uh, if he is applying to ligo based work programming experience will be very important because mostly data analysis so if you have some sort of project uh, that you have done uh, do mention it in your sop yeah so um there was this question mm. i'm a bit confused regarding whether to chase a paper or focus on learning right now for example i want to work in theoretical qft ngr i don't know how to go about it whether to learn everything first or start projects it is obvious that i can't start projects in these fields without proper knowledge and it seems almost impossible right now to get a paper in these fields i mean with qft ngr um like ideally if you have taken a course in them so the first course then you have at least the basic you know you know the einstein field equation and qft you know a few lagrangians <laughs> and then yeah i think learning happens on the project mostly yeah so you if you get a project then you sort of learn about that project and you go from there and then a paper is it's great if it happens but if it doesn't it's fine like it's not a requirement like my research into internship in that was in particle physics i did not know particle physics at that time but through the project i did manage to learn some of it so yeah usually projects help in learning a lot yeah that's true that's true even i want to add to that i mean uh, i don't know anything about star formation or something but i got this internship and like worked on it for like something like two months and uh yeah i did learn many thing up uh, from the project actually uh, working on it and from the data and then uh, googling stuff of course and yeah so the project will help you learn actually but you should be open to learning and yeah and yeah like in, theor in theoretical yeah. qft and gr like it is very rare for undergrads to have papers like it's very very rare so yeah, if I mean, you don't have it that's not a very big disadvantage anywhere just uh, just familiarity with the subject and that you have tried to do some basic like say even if you done you went with a professor and you just read about the research that has happened so far that is also like good enough okay nagul oh uh, yeah just, yeah so um there's this question um, so do online certificates uh, play an important role i 
don't think so they play, i mean if it not if it's not in your transcript it won't play much role i mean that's baseline yeah it's hard to verify right any anything that can't be verified easily and not trusted is probably yeah. not that useful if it's in uh, if, if if like if that thing is in your transcript i mean it's it's worth it if it's not then i just try to learn but Oh, okay. um, I disagree on this a lot. I, I'll, I'll not with the what what has been presented so far. Uh, online certificates will matter if you're going for a branch switch. So in my interview, so I I took NPTEL courses, though I could not provide them in my official transcript, but I definitely included all the certificate links in my CV, and the committee did open all these links at that time, and that was the kind of in my interview, I was able to convince them that I will be able to do a physics, a physics degree uh, after switching from computer science. And um, if you are applying for, uh, if you are from uh, switching from engineering to physics, online certificates will matter, not these uh, courses from EDX and uh, uh, Coursera, because they already know their content is not worthwhile any anymore. So. But they do not know about NPTEL courses. And when they hear the tag that it's offered by IITs and IISCs, even though we know their assignments are not very good, but they hear that tag. So they realize to some extent, OK, so maybe these courses are not that bad. Uh, so the student might have learned something. So NP like, these courses might help you. But if you are in a physics degree, they may, they may not help you. Oh, OK. Thanks, Nicole. That was, I guess, new things. <laughs> um, so there's this question. Dear panelists, do you think that the skills that are taught and that, that are taught in PhD or grad school can be equally valued while self-learning? For example, suppose you are very good at skills, but you don't have a have a PhD. Would you get the job even if one who holds a PhD and doesn't have those skills get the gets the job? Supposing the competition is so high that there are thousands of who don't get a job still having a PhD. I guess it's a uh, uh, skill versus PhD degree, something like that. And you won't I mean, have, sorry, yeah, Akash, go ahead. I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, is it academic job or I don't know, uh, or industry oriented job? I mean, I don't know. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, take the both instances i guess but okay. yeah okay. Both. i think in academia a phd would matter i mean yeah in academia the phd is needed for uh, non academic like industry positions uh, the skills are more important so it doesn't matter how you got them uh, through a job or through a phd or whatever Yeah, for 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 like a faculty job, you need a PhD in the sense that it's not like they'd want a PhD degree. You need solid research, basically a lot of published papers and grants and stuff. So like, it's not the degree that they're looking for. It's just solid research that you've done, which usually happens with the PhD and after that. So there, there was this question that um, would you recommend having all the two and three LORs from the same university? Yeah, it doesn't matter as long as they are all different people. <laughs> yeah, yeah as long as they're strong. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like as long as they're strong LORs, it's fine. Like they know you well and can write well for you, then it's good enough. That's not an issue. So um, I was asking that, um, is it okay to have some gap between undergrad and masters? Uh, meaning, is it okay to have a, um, a break after BSc? Yeah, I know a few people who had that. It's perfectly fine, I think. Yeah, I think Nakul has also a year gap, right? Yes. yes. But let you should be different in SOP. Like, what were you doing for that year? Yeah. 
actually so, uh, Nicole, and- i think you uh, said that it was quite useful right the one year gap so could you elaborate a bit um it was useful primarily because of the fact that i was in an engineering degree and um even though i was studying courses on my own but um it was i knew that uh, europe will definitely not select me because they have this strict requirement that they require a bachelor's degree in physics and um, i know that the options in us or canada are already gone because i did not have any sufficient research experience so i realized that i definitely need to take a year break <clears throat> so um um so i did a research assistantship role in quantum computing <clears throat> so i explained in a paragraph as to what i did there and why i took a one year gap as well so it does not matter that much i think it probably will be in your favor if you are taking a gap year but i don't know if a gap year after between a masters and a phd will be that helpful um, like if you are a physics degree in a, in your masters program and then you are taking a year gap unless until you are working in some research industry or <clears throat> some other role it's fine but um, i personally do worry because i have to get an academia then that means 5 years of postdoc then 3 to 4 years of post, uh, 5 years of phd then 3 to 4 years of postdoc so every year for me counts a lot now i've already taken a gap year i do not think i'll take a gap year in my master between masters and phd yeah thanks nakul um so we'll be um continuing the q and a for only 5 minutes or so and then we'll be discussing an, another topic so yeah last two questions that i would like to ask is that um there was this question about um, so how valuable is it to have a abstracts in springer or uh, nature and uh, i mean generals like that very valuable <laughs> in short yeah <laughs> yeah papers are great no, okay no akash as someone who would like to answer something nakul i mean yeah, it's well it's it's very i mean it would be useful i mean it's not bad okay 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 so yeah so i guess uh, jesh can to, from there mm-hmm. here uh i guess uh, there are two more questions that were in the chat uh, uh, okay okay uh i'll read them uh if you want uh, yeah yeah sure 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 yeah just a minute so one of the question was is it okay to get lor written from some school teacher or some founder of an organization with whom i have worked and we both know uh, each other so that is one of the question Uh, anyone would like to elaborate on that in general yeah they should be yeah anshuman go ahead uh, like uh, the i'll say that about the latter one like if you have worked with someone and the uh, the phd program is okay with uh, having non academic like something from an employer of sorts uh, then it's fine you can men- have one lor from them uh, but for the teachers aspect uh, it's like the last resort like if you have if you are do applying for a masters as well it's better if you have your profs bachelor's profs uh, some or some internship guide writes it okay i think uh, i think uh, if uh, if anyone would like to add something uh, okay then we have the last question and then there is a small topic that we uh, like you uh, would like to have views of panelists on that so the last question is uh, it's i'm doing masters in astrophysics from uh, liverpool john moores it's uh, a one year masters and my bachelor's was in computer science so i have experience with computing and i'm pretty much comfortable with astrophysics now but i don't have many projects given that my master has start masters has started in september and is supposed to end by august should i go ahead with the phd application now I think yes. I mean, it depends. But in general, yes, I would say, because 
else he, he would need something some research experience also uh, at the end of the masters so it's hard to say but i think it should go for psc I mean, more importantly, are you ready to <laughs> apply? To yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. If you are ready, then everyone is ready. Uh, I think uh, we are done with the Q and One question yeah. by Rishabh uh, that was answered. Sorry, uh, regarding summer internship or something. Yeah. I'll read uh, it just. Yeah, yeah, you can read it out. Uh, basically, due to this COVID situation. Uh, many summer internship programs are uh, right now uncertain. Should I put my energy in uh, writing to pros for projects and all, or remind it my college and try to invest in some long term projects? He's doing his master's in IT, Kanpur, by the way. I guess if you can do it in IT, Kanpur, I mean, that's that's great, right? Like, you, then you don't need to go anywhere, you can just do it at your college. And you can apply to others and just try and see what happens, I guess. I think uh, I mean, if it's remote, if it's remote, I think uh, it's not a problem. I mean, uh, he can do it from anywhere. So, but if it's not remote and uh, the professor actually, in, uh, I mean, the institute is ready to uh, like accommodate him at there. So I think it's not a problem. But yeah, if it's remote, then you can do it from anywhere. Okay, I think uh, that is it for the Q&A session. Uh, we got lot, lots of questions. If uh, you people have any more questions, you can join the group, surely. Uh, we have provided the link as well. You can join the group and you can ask your questions there. Uh, now we have a small topic for discussion. I'll share my screen and I'll briefly uh, present the idea that we are looking for the discussion. So just a second. Uh, is my screen visible? Yeah. Okay. So this is it. So uh, the what we are uh, what what the sm uh, I'll just uh, smallly uh, uh, try to you know uh, explain what it uh, it is about. So it's basically about. Uh, uh, courses versus uh, versus in, uh, internship or projects. Basically, people are looking for, you know, courses. Uh, what courses can they do, and what are the projects that are available to them? So, what are your views? Like, should we run after uh, getting more into courses stuff, or should we look for out more for uh, more for uh, you know, uh, projects? Like, people look for a lot of projects which are a few week duration and uh, uh, get stuck in that. So, what are your views on that? Uh, any panelists can start with it. I think it's basically like a juggling thing. Like you try to uh, have some experience, research experience through the projects as well as have uh, ensure that the courses don't go completely haywire. And it takes time. Like sometimes you might uh, focus too much on one and realize that you're uh, getting carried away in that direction so it is difficult i agree with that but put them to a certain level as is necessary because uh, you like phd applications look for some amount of research experience as well or at least skill development along with your academic background okay if anyone would like to add something to it yeah i think i think that sums it up pretty much uh thank you all for coming to this session it was really wonderful to have you all at the, as the panelist and thank you to the participants for joining this providing us such wonderful questions i think it was helpful to all of us and uh, we'd be looking out to, uh, to having more such sessions with you all uh thank you for joining in uh yeah, that is it. Thank, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was really helpful for me too. Thank you. Bye bye.